Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Things We Said Today. This is Steve Marinucci, uh, contributor to Billboard and Access.com, welcoming you to another of our shows where we talk about anything and everything and all sorts of Beatles stuff uh, that we can conjure up. Um, let me first introduce uh, my gang of three, um, starting uh, from the north, uh, from the cold state of Maine. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, he's the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. Next, uh, coming down the pike um, in the... Probably cold state of Connecticut. Uh, well, it's cold everywhere. The host of the show, Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And finally, down in Pennsylvania, uh, the author of Changing Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation, and the executive editor of Beatle Fan, Mr. Al Sussman. Hello, Al. Hi, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And we're back again. Uh, we we took a week off, and uh, but uh, we're back uh, here, and we're gonna we have uh, a subject we're gonna talk about. Um, but first, we're gonna drop a couple of news items. Um, in the two weeks that we were gone, we lost somebody else uh, musically, uh, a music big music name, and that would be Greg Lake. And of course, there's a Beatle connection with Greg. Uh, he played in probably one of the more interesting uh, versions of Ringo's All-Star Band. Um, that was with uh, Ian Hunter and God, who else was in that? I can't remember. Howard who else. Jones. Howard Jones. Yeah, I know. You know, that band, that particular lineup sticks out because it was such a, a different lineup. Um, it was the, probably the most musically progressive that he has had. And I uh, I mean it's it's amazing that the people that were in that lineup and of course Greg was in it and um, Roger Hodgson Roger Hodgson yep yep and your favorite uh, drummer next to Ringo in the All Star Band who is Sheila E Sheila E that's true Sheila <laughs> Sheila was uh, Sheila was awesome Sheila was, oh, she was was she was she was a kick uh, I in fact I really wish he would he would bring her back. But uh, she was fantastic. Uh, you guys want to say anything about Greg Lake? Who first? Whoever wants to go first. Alan, you want to start? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, it seemed a little odd for him to be in the All-Stars. I mean, I think it worked out very well. But, I mean, he was from more in the sort of progressive end of rock, um, mm -hmm. you know, earlier in his career. Um, I think before ELP, he was in King Crimson, the early version right. of King Crimson, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that was actually a big loss for King Crimson, although they've obviously done quite well since then. But yeah, you know, and, and that wasn't generally speaking the kind of music that Ringo did, you know. So, but you know, he he made it work, you know, uh, on that tour, and uh, yeah, he was he was really an incredible bass player. Very good songwriter, and uh, yeah, another all-star alumnus. So, yeah. and he had a and he had a fantastic. I mean, his voice was his, he was a great vocalist. He mm -hmm. he had a fantastic yeah. voice. That's true. Mm -hmm. he, he really, really did. Ken, you want to you want to say something? I'm just you know, it's another tremendous loss this year, and it's kind of ironic that we lost Keith Emerson in the same year yeah. and we lost mm -hmm. Craig Lake. I mean, how ironic is that? Mm -hmm. And um, you were just talking about the All-Stars. The beauty of the All-Stars is that you got so many different musicians together on the same stage who musically might be different. And I think that lineup, which was, I believe, in 2001, was the most eclectic group of musicians mm -hmm. that Ringo ever assembled. And yet it all worked. And that was the beauty of it all, to go from... I mean, they played in the Court of the Crimson King, which I never in my wildest dreams ever thought I'd ever see Ringo drum behind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that and Sheila E. drumming on the song. And then to go from that into something like The Glamorous Life from Sheila E. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all of the uh, keyboard work, the great keyboard work that uh, Howard Jones did in the 80s and 90s and doing the hits from that time period, and Roger Hodgson, who's one of my favorite singers in rock, 
and Greg Lake. I'm glad you said that about his voice because I don't think he gets that much credit. He's a he was a great singer. Mm-hmm. He really, 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 really was. I, I um, lucky man comes to comes to mind. I think yeah. that's the song that sticks in my head more than anything uh, from him. Well, still uh, you turn me on was a great song, and you you can't go through Christmas without hearing I believe in Father Christmas. Which absolutely, is a gem. Yeah. right. Right. So, uh, you know, between right. his work with King Crimson, ELP, his solo work, and he was a great addition for the All Stars. You know, no, um, that lineup uh, alone was was amazing. I thought right. it could be my favorite lineup of all the All Stars. Really? Yeah. No, I, I I I I still have to go back to the uh, the uh, Lee Le- Le- Helm. And, yeah. yeah. I was, in fact, I was listening to. I got a copy of the four CD complete. Uh, Last Waltz, uh, which a- which actually I know they're doing a big promotion to that this year, but the the complete Last Waltz has been out since 2002 actually, and I picked up a used copy at the local record store and the oh my god that is just so oh it is just so good that's and the sound quality on that is tremendous mm-hmm. if you mm. don't have if you if you just have the two, two CD set. Hunt down the the four CD with all with all the uh, the added tracks and and apparently they haven't done anything to it uh, to the CDs it's to the CDs themselves for the anniversary this year they what they did add was I think an essay but the four CDs are still the same so, wasn't there isn't there like a DVD in the uh, right the, 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 there's the, the a new, the new package a blue oh Blu-ray, Blu-ray. okay of the right. of the of the film. But I think the Blu-ray, it, if I if I looked correctly, the Blu-ray was already out. So what they've really done is kind of just repackaged the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, but uh, yeah, I mean it. That was a that was a, a wonderful lineup. A wonderful lineup. Mm-hmm. So, Al, do you have something else to say, Al? Yeah, in the you know in the very early days of uh, freeform progressive rock radio, uh, when King Crimson's first album came out in 1969, obviously the title song was the one that got the most airplay. But there was also uh, this other this one track called "I Talk to the Wind," uh, which is which is by Greg Lake and has a wonderful vocal. And it's of of the same quality as mm. his work his work with ELP. Mm. Okay. Well, cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Mm-hmm. And the other news item of the week is for those of you in the New York area, the fifteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth, there is a tribute concert to Sir George Martin. At uh, St. John the Baptist Cathedral in, um, I believe it's Manhattan, Mm -hmm. and it's with um, Gary Brooker and the. It's actually the Paul Winter Concerts, Winter Solstice concert, and Gary Brooker is the special guest of the evening, and that should be just absolutely amazing. It's a it's a tribute, like I said, to George Martin, and it should be absolutely beautiful. Uh, Both men. In case you're not aware, had albums produced by George Martin. So, um, Gary's was his first solo album, and and um, Paul Winters was was called Icarus. And it should be a, an amazing, amazing evening. Um, I really uh, wish I, I talked to Gary Brooker last week. I'm sorry, I, I told him, and uh, I wish I was in the on the East Coast because I would definitely go to that show. It, Sounds like a great show, but the good news is that Procol Harum will be touring and recording next year for their 50th anniversary, which is uh, um, a big deal. So that should be really cool too. So is this is this going to be the full group? Well, it's it, the full group as it currently stands. Okay. Uh, it's not going to be because because I, th- I think everybody's still alive, right? It's the same group he said. From about 1992. Oh, okay. So yeah, it, it's that group. So yeah, it's the group that's that's toured before. So anyway, today we're going to talk about. Well, we have we we're going to debate the question if the Beatles were musical innovators after Revolver and Sgt. Pepper. 
and there are some contradictory sides on uh, uh, among us, contradictory views. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, I think I think I'll start with Al. Yeah, I, I got to thinking about that because uh, Ken happened to mention a couple of weeks ago <laughs> that uh, so many people now consider Revolver to be uh, the Beatles' greatest album. Mm-hmm. And and it's uh, you know certainly uh, it, it may very well be their most innovative album, and you know and uh, if if not Sergeant Pepper is certainly in the running there. But I got to thinking that after after Sergeant Pepper, and this is something that also that came up in the uh, in the the eight days a week uh, film. Uh, you know, went through you know the end of the touring, and then through a little bit on the sessions for Sergeant Pepper, and then it was like in 30 seconds, and they made five more albums, and the next thing you know, they're on the rooftop. <laughs> mm-hmm. there, you know, so it's I, I got the thinking that after Sergeant Pepper, in the nearly three years between the release of Sergeant Pepper and the, you know, at least the more or less official breakup of the group, that the kind of the innovators in the, you know, in what, what, what was becoming known as the, the new rock, the, the real innovators at that point were, were Jimi Hendrix and The Who and early Pink Floyd and cream and king crimson and king crimson <laughs> yeah. there we get exactly. there we go exactly and led zeppelin but were the beatles the the question is were the beatles still innovators during those last 3 years or so of their of their their career as a group and uh it's uh, you know there are points to be made Positively or negatively, and I think Alan's got an alternative opinion. But you haven't but said what know, yours was know. yet. Yeah, you haven't said you haven't said yours yet. <laughs> yeah. What's your? You don't think you don't think? Well, they were? well, I go, I, I go, I go back and forth. Actually, you know, certainly they, uh, in terms of instrumentation and stylistically, the, you know, they're really there's not that much on those those last really four albums it really they, they did the equivalent of four albums between Sgt. pepper and and let it be you know that's instrumentally innovative you might say you know i'll give you i'll give you an example in 1967 on their and and this is a <laughs> these are two examples that that steve's gonna like in 1967 on their headquarters album uh, the monkeys made made some of the specifically Michael Nesmith uh, made some of the first use of pedal steel guitar on a rock record, and then on their next album, Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones Limited, they uh, they made one of the, certainly if not the first use, certainly one of the first uses of the Moog synthesizer mm-hmm. on a on a rock on a rock album. And and it just kind of seems that it, during those last three years, the Beatles weren't that musically adventurous, if you want to say. You know, certainly not. I'm not. I'm certainly not knocking anything, any of the recordings they made during that period. But I'm um, just thinking that maybe those albums, the White Album, uh, Magical Mystery Tour. Abbey Road, Let It Be, Half of Yellow Submarine, weren't mm-hmm. as weren't as instrumentally innovative as say Revolver and Sergeant Pepper had been. Mm. I think I think you can. Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I think you can argue that depends on how mm-hmm. you want to argue creative and and innovative. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, how do you quantify my, innovative? My, yeah, I mean, my feeling is, "Hey Jude" was innovative because it broke the mold on the three on the three minute single. All, although mm-hmm. earlier that same summer, yep. Richard Harris had had a number two single in in America with uh, MacArthur <laughs> Park, which was which was also over seven minutes. That's right. Okay. 
Uh, and Alan will like this one. Revolution number nine was innovative. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I know we've mentioned what a shame Mary Jane. Mm-hmm. Um, which I well, first of I, all that never came out commercially at the time. Right. No, but I'm, I'm, but they I'm did kidding. it. I mean, they did it. Yeah, they did it. And so I think that you know, and and we've heard it since, and and I think that was definitely innovative. I think Yellow Submarine, both you know, both the song and the movie were innovative. Although we're not talking about outside of, we're not really talking about outside the music. I think Abbey Road was innovative because it, the the suite on the other side was you know, you know on the back side was was something that not too many people had done, you know, and uh, outside of straight music, I think you could say Apple Records was innovative, was musically innovative because of the diversity of, of musical groups that mm-hmm. was on that label. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I would, I, it depends on how you want to define it as far as I'm concerned. I think you definitely could make and I and I had a whole bunch of things written down but but basically I'm going to just cut it down to that and say you know that really I mean as far as innovative goes innovative according to you know you you can have different degrees but I think they were definitely innovative so except Alan, what's, yeah, except, oh, except go ahead. what's what's innovative about what's the new Mary Jane the, the lyrically very lyr- uh, I mean, it well, and the mu- musically too. I mean, it's it's you didn't get a pop group, basically a pop group, which is in the business of making hits, going into the studio and doing that kind of kind of freeform freakout, which John was doing more and more of, and some were getting on the records and and that one didn't. But um, mm-hmm. and I didn't mention I, well, I didn't mention you know my name, which did get on a record. Mm-hmm. So and they worked on that for like two or three years. Mm-hmm. Well, some people yeah. don't necessarily appreciate the real avant-garde stuff, like mm. Revolution Number no. Nine or What's the New Mary Jane, much to the same degree that they didn't they didn't appreciate a lot of what John and Yoko were doing on their albums together. Yeah, but you know, so, you could talk about whether people appreciate it, but if the subject is whether it's innovative, you know, here they are completely breaking the mold of what mm-hmm. is expected of a pop group and that is innovation. Oh, I agree. Right. I'm not I'm not denying that they were innovative doing that. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily look at what's the new Mary Jane as being so innovative lyrically. Mm-mm. Like you said, Steve, I don't know what's so incredible about the lyrics of that song. But I do believe a lot of what you said there, Steve, to be true. You have to take a look at the whole picture and look at, um, like, Apple Records. Like mm-hmm. we had discussed, all the, the variety of uh, the music and the art that was put on there. And they took a lot of chances with the artists that they put on the Apple label. But by the same token, innovative is really, you know, it's a matter of opinion of what you consider to be innovative. In many ways, I think when you're musically eclectic, which the Beatles were from the very beginning, that's being innovative. And I don't think there's ever been a body of work more eclectic than the White Album. As Absolutely. much as I was just about to ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> as much as you look at Revolver, oh my God, it's eclectic all over the place. But mm-hmm. the White Album, you've got the most extremes you've ever had on a record, going from Helter Skelter to Honey Pie. You know, and then doing something avant-garde like Revolution Number no. Nine. Then you got country and western on there like Don't Pass Me By or Rocky Raccoon. Something bluesy like Your Blues, uh, quasi classical like Piggies. Um, you know, there's so much variety all over the place. They stretch the limits. I think uh, on White Album, I think that's being innovative to itself. And then Good Night. You know, then ending, going from Revolution Number no. Nine right into Good Night. Yeah, right. So, and not only that, how about just doing a complete reversal of going from Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour to just the bare basics of being a band for the most part? They had other musicians on the White Album, mm-hmm. but you know, most of the White Album was just them. You know, to do that and strip it and to to have more of a raw sound to go in a completely different direction. Wasn't that taking a chance instead of just continuing along the same lines of what they've been doing with, say, Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour? Alan, you haven't said anything. Why don't you go ahead and, and say something? Yeah. Um, 
You know, I think, I mean, while on one hand it's a, it's a great debate topic, uh, part of me also feels that it's sort of a, a, a silly debate topic because from my mm -hmm. point of view, it's axiomatic that the Beatles were the greatest <laughs> creative group of, you know, basically all time and therefore innovation is an important part of that. So, yes, of course they continue to be innovative. But to pick up, you know, what, what you guys were saying about the White Album, um, I want to sort of drag this into a sort of classical thing. Um, it, it, I can't say for sure whether the Beatles had anything like this in mind, um, but back in like Baroque Renaissance times, composers would do this kind of piece that they called a summa, which was basically a summation of everything they knew about a particular topic. So Bach's Art of Fugue wasn't really meant, it wasn't written really to be performed. It was a summa. It was a piece of music written to show everything you could do with a fugue. The B minor mass was a summa, everything that you can do to set a mass. And I kind of think that the White Album is a summa of pop music styles. I mean, it, in the 30 tracks, there is basically every single kind of popular music you can imagine. You talked about um, some of them, the country western and, and um, you know, Good Night was a, a kind of, you know, that song could have come out in the uh, – late 40s or 50s or even earlier in a way. It's, it's, it could have been like one of those great American songbook kind of songs. Um, you begin the record with basically the Beach Boys, you know, um, and then there is folk rock and there is, uh, while my guitar gently weeps, is, uh, you know, getting into the area of rock where solos are important and, and that kind of thing. And basically, if you look at it track by track, every every track represents some aspect of where popular music has gone um, and not just popular music because Revolution Number no. 9 was a piece of music concrete which was a, a basically classical thing where you would take different streams of, of sound and make something out of them, uh, make a piece out of them. And, and I, I, a lot of people hate it. I think it's brilliant. But, um, and, and as I think Steve pointed out, the, the juxtaposition of that and Good Night is also an incredible touch. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the idea of, of creating a, a collection that would range that widely is in itself, you know, you could say, well, okay, maybe it's not innovative because they're taking existing forms and looking at them. But they were basically also saying, hey, we are a pop quartet who – formerly gave you I want to hold your hand and she loves you and we can do basically anything we want in pop and a little beyond pop too um, mm. and we can do it basically better than everybody else <laughs> you know, and could you so. could you basically also say that just the the mere concept of a two record set mm -hmm. with a plain white cover yeah and 30 songs within, would that be – could that be labeled as being innovative? You could say that. I mean it's mm -hmm. – um, you know, you, I think you needed the 30 songs to accomplish that overview of, of, of pop. And it was, you know, more than people were used to getting. I mean, you know, double albums, triple albums, even quadruple albums are pretty plentiful these days, but not so much in 1968. Mm-hmm. Um, not to mention a blank cover. I mean, yeah, right? Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna. I was just gonna mention that. Yeah, I mean, that was be a beautiful work of art. Uh, you know, a beautiful art move that uh, you could probably uh, uh, that Yoko something like Yoko would have done. You know, yeah. I mean, that it's that kind of art. Right. Yeah. Right. And there is a guy. Um, uh, his name is his last name is Chang. I can't remember what his first name was. Actually, he he actually is he's a, a very young guy. I mean, is he is way too young to have grown up with the White Album, but his parents did. Um, and he heard it as a kid and he now has a uh, an artwork that is called We Buy White Albums. And basically what he does is he sets up in a shop someplace. Um, I saw it in New York. It's been all over the country. He's continually buying white albums and noting down the number 
of that's you know stamped on the album. I think he only really wants original editions. And you walk into this shop, and it looks like a record store, except all they have are bins and bins and bins of white albums, <laughs> and they're on the wall. And, you know, and some of them are in great shape. Some of them people have drawn on. Some of them have coffee stains on them. And another thing that he did as part of this art piece was he multi-tracked them. <laughs> he, t- he Every time he would get a white album, he would record it, you know, starting at the same time. But with turntables being a little bit imprecise, they begin going out of phase. And so what you end up with by the end of each side is really kind of a, a mess. And, you know, and in a certain way, that that edges on to another thing that was going on at the time the White Album was made, which was the beginning of minimalism in classical music, where um, Steve Reich, for instance, was taking tapes and syncing them up and having them go out of phase. Um, and then the, another corner of minimalism was doing repetition of short phrases and then maybe adding a, a bar and another bar. And But people heard it as just repetitive. And so when you look at Hey Jude, you know, it's not just that it's a seven-minute single. It's that, like, the last four minutes of it are just repetition. It's just the same thing over and over with a build-up, and that's exactly what the minimalists were doing, or some of the minimalists. Um, and John did that again on I Want You, She's So Heavy, you know, that guitar mm-hmm. figure that keeps repeating, and then the synthesizer noise gets overlaid, but it's repeated and repeated and repeated, <laughs> and that is also, you know, minimalism when hardly anybody in the rock world was thinking about minimalism, or at least in the commercial corner of the rock world. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have yet another, I mean, we, one or more of you have mentioned already the, the, the suite on side two of Abbey Road, which was definitely mm-hmm. innovative musically. I mean, we can... We can take or leave John's comment about it being basically cheating by taking bunches of unfinished songs and stringing them together. The fact is, it works as a suite. It unfolds beautifully and then goes into that sort of big jam at the end where they're each getting a a moment in the spotlight and trading solos back and forth, which is something else they didn't tend to do um, Mm -hmm. in their heyday. But there's another interesting little musical (laughs) weirdness there. The basic end chord progression going back to, say, Baroque times was, you know, what they call a 5-1. So it's like from, you know, if you're in the key of C, it would be like from G to C. You know, it's it's Mm -hmm. just a standard. I Want You, She's So Heavy cuts off on what would be the equivalent of five. It's unresolved. You know, you expect Mm. it to have a final chord at least after it, but it, it ends right in the middle and right where the it would move from five to one. Um, Mm. Here Comes the Sun is in the same key. And so it opens with basically what would be the one chord. So you turn the album over and you've got this unresolved five and then it becomes the resolution as Here Comes the Sun begins. Um, Exactly the same thing happens with Her Majesty. Her Majesty, as you know, is missing the final chord. And that final chord would be the resolution from five to one. You turn the album over again <laughs> and come together's very first chord is in the key that would be the one chord that resolves Her Majesty. So you have this, this weird little cyclical chain of Abbey Road. You keep turning it over and it keeps resolving itself. Now, it's, it's almost certain that the Beatles had no idea that that was happening. Oh, I bet they did. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's just a little too weird. But yeah. That's but it great. works. It works. That. You know, that's the thing. Weird or not, it, it, it just happens to work out. Um, so yeah, I think you know in the, in those last years of the Beatles, there's tons of innovation. I mean, I personally don't see an awful lot of innovation on Let It Be. That's the one album yes. where I would have to mm-hmm. you know. But let's say they were taking a time out to you know fight with each other, uh, and and Let It Be is. You know, I mean, they were trying to do something, and what they were trying to do. They had some difficulty accomplishing because there were too many disagreements about whether to do what they were supposed Mm -hmm. to be doing. But the other albums, you know, Abbey Road and the White Album, 
you know, those I think are brilliantly innovative albums. They don't get the, the, the attention that Pepper and Revolver do because Revolver was such a leap out of, you know, from Rubber Soul. And Pepper has the whole atmosphere of the cover and the times and, you know, the 60, 67 Summer of Love and all that. And, and the White Album and Abbey Road don't have quite those extra things, but but the music is 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 as innovative as can be. Mm-hmm. There is one other one other thing from that from that period that uh, we haven't really touched on that uh, that could be construed as being innovative. And I know there are two very varying opinions <laughs> among. Mm-hmm. <laughs> among us about this and that would be the film of magical mystery tour uh-huh. <laughs> you know uh you know one could say that that would be innovative because of the fact that no uh no mainstream rock group to that point in time had done uh you know and basically an in-house you know that had you know totally on their own done a long form music film hmm. Mm. I'd have to think and, about that. It seems to me also, that somebody else yeah. did, but and also the fact that it was free form. Yes, and uh, yeah. even though we brought this up before, because I I always relate the Beatles and and the Goons and Monty Python, you know, all together mm-hmm. because they yeah. were all influenced by the Goons anyway. But sure. I can see so much from Magical Mystery Tour in Monty Python what they did later on, in particular in their TV show. Mm-hmm. They borrowed from that, mm-hmm. as well as the goons. But it's all one family. You know? <laughs> That's just the way that I look at it. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. But Magical Mystery Tour, to me, I think, was innovative for its time. One th- one thing that we didn't, or a couple of things we didn't bring up, we haven't, I don't think anybody mentioned Get Back, the song, which is, uh, you know, one of the, probably the better down-to-earth rock and roll songs the Beatles did. Right, Across- but it's not, it's not really innovative, though. Because at that point there were, you know, the, uh, that was right in the middle of that whole kind of back to the back to basics movement, and oh, know, I think that, I, th- I think they were they were at the front of that. I mean, well, not really because that really it started with John Wesley Harding, Dylan's album, in early '68, and then then you had Lady Madonna, uh, and then you had the Stones doing Jumpin' Jack Flash, mm-hmm. and then you had. The White Album and the Stones Beggars Banquet, uh, so so Get Back was pretty far down the road. I I just think I mean I I just think the whole the song itself is you know uh, innovative on its own and I mean it it sounded so good and of course you know seeing them do it on the rooftop was great. The other thing we didn't mention was because which. Harmonically, you know, the harmonics on that, especially if you see it uh, in the Love Show, without the, you know, with the, uh, or you hear the Love album with the with the uh, instrumentation stripped off. That uh, that's you know that's really beautiful, and also uh, something, uh, you know, George Harrison song, which by the way today happens to be uh, uh, Frank Sinatra's birthday, and Sinatra, you know, it it was a song that Sinatra did, so. And called the greatest love song of the century, was it? Something like that? Something I like think that. he said it was his favorite Lennon McCartney's. And his favorite <laughs> Lennon McCartney's song, right. right. That, he did, that he did. He did call it a Lennon McCartney song. But, um, I, you no, know, I, no I, one's I, debating whether or not they put out great music. No one will debate that something right. is one of the greatest love songs. Same thing mm-hmm. with Because. And when I, when I think of the song Because, I think of, you know, it's one of the greatest examples of three-part harmony from the Beatles. Yes, you know, absolutely. Along with you know this boy and yes it is and those songs, no one's debating that. They still mm-hmm. continue to put out great music. The whole issue really comes down to innovation and what you perceive as innovation. Mm-hmm. I would like right. to just bounce off one thing that Alan said because he brought up that uh, with Hey Jude the the uh, the refrain being mm-hmm. repeated for the last three minutes. I mm-hmm. kind of felt that that Donovan copied that idea. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure. He did. When he did Atlantis, Atlantis, mm-hmm. sure. You know, right. The last few minutes are just the chorus right. of, of the song repeated over and over again. But I think, and maybe I, I'll ask the three of you this question because I'm not that sure. But when the Beatles, they did something which which I always associate with Broadway music and show tunes and everything. Mm-hmm. But 
for example, on Sgt. Pepper, when they brought back Sgt. Pepper, the song, in the reprise, that kind of harkens back to things that you do in musicals. You bring back an earlier song mm -hmm. that was heard. And likewise, they did the same thing on Abbey Road when they did the Golden Slumbers Carry the Way at the End medley, and then they brought back oh, yeah. mm -hmm. You Never Give Me Your Money in that song. Is that something that was new for rock bands at that time? Hmm. That's an interesting thought. I, I, uh, I'm not. I'm not. Well, curious. the, the Stones did it with "Sing This All Together" hmm. on mm, uh, that's strong, on Satanic huh? Majesty, but that was after yeah. Pepper. Um, hmm. But I, I mean, they they had seen musicals, you know. Bit. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were familiar with musicals and what went into them, and 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 how they worked, and I could see them bringing that into. Um, since they were, after all, with with Pepper and 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 Revolver, I think they were thinking in terms of albums as you know even before that. In fact, well, we're talking about the the post Pepper period, but I mean all through once they began thinking of their albums as albums rather than just bunches of hits thrown mm -hmm. onto a big disc, um, that in itself was innovative. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think. I don't think a single one of their albums was put out without any thought about what goes well next to what else and what should be the first, second, third song, what should be the fourth, why. You know, I, I don't think it was done haphazardly for, for anything they did, you know, going back back to Please Please Me. Mm. Sure. That's one of the arguments that people make about the, uh, the you know, the American albums. Yeah. That uh, that you know that that they were bastardized because the Beatles had you know gone to great lengths to sequence their British albums the way they wanted, and so to have them then broken up into and and made into things like Yesterday and Today or the Beatles' second album or something new was you know in effect bastardizing their efforts. I hope Bruce Spicer's not listening. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Bastardized. Okay. That's a pretty harsh word there. Yes, yes, it is. It is. And there um, was one other thing I wanted to bring up about the White Album, which ahead, I found Ken. to be very unique. And it wasn't the first time the Beatles did this. But, you know, there are people who nowadays look at the White Album as though it was a lot of solo work. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of tracks on the White Album that either had just one Beatle on them like Julia, mm. like Blackbird. Like, uh, why don't we do it in the room? Mm -hmm. right. No, that's, that's um, Ringo's drumming on it. Is it? Do it in the ah. yeah. But um, Mother Nature's Son. But even before that, you can point to Yesterday and uh, Within You Without You was only George Harrison, the Beatle on that. Mm -hmm. But it was more pronounced on the White Album. There's a lot mm -hmm. of songs that don't have all four of them on it, and yet it's still the Beatles. Right. Is that innovative in your minds? Were there other bands who were doing that where one member would go off and just record, you know, one song by himself and it's still the band? Hmm. The monkeys. I think you could I think you could make a an argument there for the monkeys because I think and I can't think of the songs off the top of my head, um, but I believe there were you know, there were a couple. Of, there were a few songs like that. Well, I mean, even the Be the Beach Boys too. Uh, you know, um, because I mean, Caroline, no, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I was thinking. I was I was thinking of about that period, but yeah, I mean that. Well, know. except that's that's a whole different thing because, you know, uh, the whole the whole scenario of Brian Wilson basically putting Pet Sounds together. While the while the group was on tour, you know that's a whole different you know that's a whole different ball game. Why? Because it was on, it was labeled the Beach Boys. Oh well, yeah, but it's not it's it's not the same as what you know what what Ken is saying about uh, uh, you know the you know there being individual tracks on which there was only one Beatle. Uh, you know, obviously in a case like you know like Pet Sounds. You know, there. You know, uh, you're going to have a song like Caroline No, where it is just Brian, but you know, most of the rest of the album. Eventually, the group did contribute. 
you know, they did contribute their vocals. But that's that's a whole different thing because basically, you know, Brian Wilson had in effect created the album before in a, in effect before the group ever got into the studio to put that lay down their vocals. So that's a whole different thing than just you know, having individual songs where there's only one Beatle. I think I think you can probably make the argument. And again, I'm I'm without looking this up. I'm I'm just kind of working off memory. The Monkees in their later albums basically did that because they, I mean, they worked with you know the Wrecking Crew and 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 especially after you know later on, as the numbers dwindled down, you know those the, a lot of those albums became you know that kind of a solo project for those guys you know you know especially my nesmith especially nesmith um, except think, except that after after the birds the bees and the monkeys most people didn't really care because you know their popularity had nosedived by that time you know or at least after or after after head but you're still so, but, but you're still talking about a situation where you know, individual members created music, and it was called by the group name. You know, um, so I mean, I, the, you know, it's it the same. Be, it's it's, it's same kind thing. of a different scenario to me, only because mm -hmm. with yeah. the Beatles, most of their recordings, yes, they had some some songs that had studio musicians, but most of their recordings were them yes. playing almost everything. Whereas with the Monkees, yes, you had headquarters, and later on, you had just us. You know, mm -hmm. but most of their albums, you had studio musicians backing. Mm -hmm. So I don't look at it the same way as I would the Beatles. So, and, and also, you take songs like Julia and Blackbird. Uh, those are songs that didn't require a full band anyway. But I'm just saying that it's still the Beatles. And to call it the Beatles, even though you didn't have all four of them on the same song, even though they'd done that prior to the White Album, I still think that's a little bit, you know, it's it's breaking the boundaries. You don't have to think it's just the four of them on every single song. Uh, what about I'm, all right? I, I, what about, for example? I mean, I'm th I'm thinking about all the groups that the Wrecking Crew worked with. Paul Revere and the Raiders is another example. Um, you have, you know, you have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of their a lot of their songs didn't have the full group either. You know, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if we're, I, we're splitting. Well, I think, I, I think, I think you, you and Ken are talking about two different things, basically. Yeah. Because I think Ken is talking about just, you know, they're the, you know, the occasional uh, side man that might be on a, uh, you know, or maybe a little bit of strings or something that might be on the odd track, but not a situation where an entire album is basically being done by, you know, by studio musicians and then, you know, and then, then the featured group adds their vocals. Right. I'm not, I'm not seeing a whole difference uh, be, uh, because different groups did different, you know, had different issues, situations. Alan, help I, me out. I, well, I, I don't, I don't see this question as one of innovation at all. I see it as one of personnel and it's, and uh, when mm -hmm. I think of innovation, yeah. I'm thinking of what happens in the music, no matter who's playing it, what, what it mm -hmm. is. Um, so I, I don't, you know, to me, this is, a, it's a, it's really a different sort of discussion. Okay. Yeah. And in that, <laughs> and, 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 and in that, vi in that vein, in that vein, Ken, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> did uh, did that kind of innovation that we were speaking of did that continue into the solo years at all? In different ways, in different times, like plastic on old band, stretching all the different styles of music that Paul continued to explore. Uh -huh. You know, doing all the more spiritual stuff that George did going deeper into it than he could have done with the Beatles. You know, those are examples right there. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, there's always the argument to be made. And innovation is great. There's no doubt about it. It's a fascinating thing to explore. But I happen to enjoy a lot of music that might not be innovative. That's just good on its own terms. There's okay. a lot of great albums that have been made that people may not point out to as being innovative, but they're just great songs. And that alone is good enough for me. I mean, you just said Let It Be is not an innovative album. I love the album still on its own terms. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, there's a lot of solo music where just song for song, they're really strong songs. The arrangements are good. The songs are good melodically, lyrically, and it doesn't have to be so innovative and great and groundbreaking. You know, and it can still stand up on its own terms for me. Okay. All right. Anyway, we got a couple more things to to take up. Um, one is um, we're actually going to take up some mail this week. And one of them uh, was about uh, the George Harrison show. And David Grazinia, I hope I pronounced that right, David. Uh, I'm, I apologize if I missed your, mispronounced your name. Uh, I'll just read part of this. He said, one of you mentioned Paul plays the solo on You're Going to Lose That Girl. All right. Which one of us was guilty on that? I think that was me. Uh, was that you? Yeah. He said, Harrison plays this on what sounds like his Strat. Despite the interviews to the contrary of the Strat showing up during Rubber Soul, they f- had them on the help sessions. The open A string of, on Ticket to Ride is one of their Strats. You want to challenge – you want to counter that one, Alan? Um, well, they'd have to pull down the Lewison book off the shelf, but I believe it was Paul. Um, no, I think I think the the listener that wrote in is correct. He's correct. Okay, I think so. Okay. Paul did play the the lead on Another Girl. Oh, you know what? That's what I'm thinking of. Mm. Duh. Okay. Okay. Um, so what do we do about that? <laughs> well, we we just did it. We just did it. I mean, we just said we did a mea, a mea culpa. We just do, do a mea culpa. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that it was, was it was a it was a song with girl in the title. <laughs> right. <laughs> there we go. There we go. And then uh, we have another letter from uh, Gordon Hartley who said, uh, "Hi again. Though a hard day's night is my fave album. They were never more together as a unit. I love Sgt. Pepper." I think in terms of the first world music record ever, so much variation. That's an interesting, interesting um, comment. Uh, mm-hmm. He said, "I recently burnt pepper with Penny Lane after Kite and have Strawberry Fields after When I'm 64. Track listening runs great with a bit of extra audience noise here and there. I even had Northern songs included after Getting Better. Not a masterpiece, but weird and certainly adds to the 60s psychedelic sound." But found it didn't quite fit in. I'm not. Sure. That's Gordon Hartley from New Zealand. I'm not sure exactly what uh, if I read that correctly. But I think what he said was he he put them he he made his own little creation, and um, that's an interesting that's an interesting idea. I'm sure um, he's not the only one to do that too. Oh I'm no, sure, I'm sure he's not. Either. But um, all you got to do is group together the singles that came out at the same time as the album. Sure. Right. You know, there are singles the end of each calendar year. Like you can put I Feel Fine and She's a Woman on Beatles for sale if you want. You know, you can do that kind of thing. And in right. some ways it works. Mm-hmm. But the singles yeah. also stand completely by themselves, too. There's a certain album from the same period we were talking about that does that very same thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have a very special announcement um, for those of you uh, out there. We have a contest. And this one's not going to uh, – all you have to do is send your name and address to Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. And we are giving away two copies of the deluxe Blu-ray version of Eight Days a Week, uh, The Touring Years. Um, yay! Yay! Mm. And we will, we will take the uh, – the entries up until Christmas Day. So there you have a little bit of time. Uh, the show goes up this week. So you'll have until Christmas Day to enter. And we will pick, I'm not sure how we will pick it, but we will pick the winners out of the entries. And it would help, should I say it would help? It would help if you tell us you lo- you know how much you love the show and why you love the show. <laughs> and which, Maybe which we'll, we'll of- print them all up and put them in a hat and draw two. Out yeah, of hat. we might we might do that too. Um, you know, tell us who's your favorite. Um, tell us who you're forming a fan club for. I don't know. Ah. Anyway, if you would like to win a copy of the Beatles Eight Days a Week, uh, the Blu-ray Deluxe version. This is the two disc version. Then uh, send us your entry, and maybe you'll be the lucky one. 
So, anybody got a comment uh, or two uh, about anything? Uh, uh, the Greg Lake thing was just really sad. Oh God, that was that was just that was terrible. I'm, I was sad to hear that. Oh, uh, one news thing we did not mention, and I got a I got an email actually today uh, about this. Um, Ringo went up to uh, Seattle this past week. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a tribute to. Uh, uh, Joe Walsh at Seattle's Music Museum of Pop Culture, MoPop. And they presented Joe Walsh with its annual Founders Award, which is given to artists who have made contributions, outstanding contributions to pop music. And Ringo was one of the speakers. Uh, Ringo spoke. Uh, Paul Allen was another one of the speakers. Uh, who, uh, Paul Allen of Microsoft fame. And there were other, there were uh, a bunch of performers: Dave Grohl, Taylor Hawkins, uh, Paul Rogers, your friend Todd Rundgren, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ken, uh, and Kenny. My, my musical director. Todd your Rose. musical director. Right. <laughs> and Robert Randolph, Robert Randolph, and Noah Hunt uh, also uh, were uh, performed, and it was a uh, a benefit for Mopop's uh, uh, youth and education initiatives, and mm-hmm. they raised. They raised one point two million dollars. Wow! Great. Wow! So, and also while we were while we were off, Ringo and Barbara attended the uh, the Kennedy Center honors, at which Joe Walsh was being uh, was being honored as as a member of the Eagles. That's right too. That's right too. I saw yeah we saw the pictures. Uh, uh, Ringo flashes uh, peace and love uh, peace sign. So. So anyway, let's hear it for Joe Walsh getting his let's due. Let's hear it. Congratulations, yeah. Joe Walsh, yeah. on both on both counts. Although seeing Joe Walsh in, in a tuxedo is a little <laughs> is, a, is a little much. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think. I, 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 well, anyway, uh, anyway, maybe I'm too used to seeing him in a bathrobe. I don't know. Mm. Probably. Uh, anybody want to say anything uh, to close out? Uh, anybody got any any plans or anything to to talk about? Uh, I've got something to plug. I was going to say, I'm sure. Ken well, of course, <laughs> of course, of course. Mr. But I Michael. can say it real quickly. Uh, on quickly. my on my syndicated show, Every Little Thing, the newest one that I just produced, um, there is a special segment devoted to songs that have Paul McCartney on drums, and it also includes. One of the very last side projects that George Harrison was ever involved in that he recorded in 2001. So that's going to be on my syndicated show, Every Little Thing. If you want to know all the stations that carry it, it's on my website. Uh, There's one page devoted to just Every Little Thing. And um, I will have a couple of special contests coming soon, one of which will involve four prizes. You can win all at once, major releases of 2016, and that's coming soon. Okay. So go to um, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Mr. Cozen, you got anything coming up that you want to talk about? No, just to say that it, you can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay. Um, Al? I'm just going to say actually the Twitter uh, contact uh, at ASUSS49 and also www.beetlefan.com for Beetle Fan Magazine because I'm thinking very seriously of getting out of the cesspool that pe- <laughs> face that Facebook has become. Ah, okay. Steve, right. you, um, I think you when you announced the contest, you didn't – I'm not sure if you gave the email address. Mm. I oh no I did things we said today radio show at gmail dot com I okay. did say that great so there it is so, again. Ken did you give your email address No I did not Thank you Steve mm. It's every little thing at att dot net And you can reach me at Beatles Examiner at gmail dot com um, I will soon I am working on a interview I did uh, just before the interview I did with Gary Brooker. Um, I'm working on an interview with Harry Benson, the photographer. I oh, right. yeah. have done it already, and, mm. and and I'm in the midst of transcribing that, and that should be up, uh, I don't know, in a few days, I hope. Um, but, have you seen uh, the new documentary? Yes, I have. It's very oh, good. Okay. Very good. I've heard, yeah, I've heard it's uh, very interesting. And you know, who's, you know who gives a... 
uh, an endorsement of Mr. Benson at the beginning of the movie. Donald Trump. Oh no! Really? <laughs> I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say Louise Harrison. <laughs> no, Donald Trump. Donald Trump is at the beginning of the video. I, I I know there are probably some Trump supporters listening out there, but uh, yeah, uh, it it is that is the case. So that was interesting, and we talked about. We talked about what it was like to uh, to photograph Donald Trump, among other things. Actually, we talked mostly about photographing the Beatles, but we talked about that. We talked about he was also the he was also on the scene the night Bobby Kennedy got shot. Mm. Right, but that's isn't he that, said he was right next to him. Yes, yeah. he was. That, yes, he that's was. a great deal of this film is about that, right? Uh, uh, some of it is, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, he uh, he talked about that too. Uh, I remember I remember that very very well because at the mm-hmm. time I was actually I had actually done some volunteer work for Bobby Kennedy uh, mm-hmm. for the campaign, and my dad woke me up in the middle of the night to tell me he'd been killed. It was it was terrible. That was tar- That was horrible. But anyway, um, so that'll be coming soon. And I have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary on Facebook that you're more than welcome to join. Anyway, I've blabbed on enough. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget the contest. And for Al Sussman, Alan Kozin, and Ken Michaels, this is Steve Marinucci of Things We Said Today saying thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.